Have you ever experienced that moment where you can see something awkward is about to happen and there's nothing you can do to prevent it? <laughs> I live that moment every time someone asks me what I do for a living. <laughs> I'm a psychometrician. The term itself tends to be a conversation stopper. And then, when people find out it has to do with mathematical modeling, statistics, and educational testing, I can single-handedly take a conversation from casual banter to complete silence to heated debate simply by talking about my profession. The reality is, tests have a bad reputation. In our lifetime, we take a lot of tests. When, it's, when it comes to education, it's safe to say that everyone takes a test at some point in their lives. Unfortunately, we tend to focus on the negative associations with testing. How many we have to take, how stressful they are, and how much time they waste. Instead, through today's talk, I hope to explore the potential of how test results, when used properly, are on the edge of motivating change. Exploring the use of test results requires learning a little bit about psychometrics, the science that underlies testing. To illustrate some of the fundamental principles, I'd like to share my journey with you as I discovered psychometrics. It may come as a surprise. I did not wake up one day and say, I want to be a psychometrician when I grow up. <laughs> I wanted to be a sports psychologist. By studying kinesiology, the study of human movement, and psychology, I developed an interest in measures. It turns out kinesiologists measure all sorts of things, from an individual's flexibility, to their wrist angles when typing, to the maximum use of oxygen when exercising. Despite the fact that many of these things are physical, turns out they're not always easy to measure. It was through kinesiology that I developed an interest in two key measurement concepts, reliability and validity. Reliability is the extent to which a measurement yields the same result when used repeatedly to measure the same thing. Okay, what does that mean? Well, imagine for a moment that you are trying to measure how far someone can reach beyond his or her toes in a seated position with their legs straight out in front of them. Turns out that if you attempt to measure the distance between their feet and their fingertips five times, it is unlikely that all five measurements would be the same. The more consistent the measurements, the more reliable they are. If we want to use our measurements to make a decision about something, then it seems pretty important that they be reliable. Validity refers to the extent to which interpretations of data reflect the entity you intended to measure. For example, you wouldn't want to use the reaching measure I mentioned earlier as an indicator of someone's overall physical fitness. NBA basketball players, might not score very well, I wouldn't want to be the one to tell them they're low on the overall fitness spectrum. <laughs> on the other hand, a more valid interpretation would be about the individual's flexibility. Validity has to do with making sure that the interpretations you are making are consistent with what is being measured. This is a critical influence on what can be said about the data and how the inferences about that data can be generalized. Reliability and validity, as critical indicators of measurement quality, represent the first pillar of educational testing. My fascination with these concepts and the challenges associated with measurement led me to research. The problem was I didn't know what I wanted to research. Through sheer luck, I was put in touch with a new faculty member at the University of Toronto. Little did I know, but this young female professor, who was kind enough to meet with a naive graduate student, was none other than a psychometrician. <laughs> when we met, she asked me what I liked about research. My response, statistics, nearly knocked her off her chair. 
Not many social science students enjoy statistics, and even fewer would admit to it being their favorite part. Her response, welcome to educational testing, changed my life. Turns out that measuring what someone knows is much more fascinating than measuring how flexible they are. <laughs> the concepts of reliability and validity become much more complex when we consider educational testing. We are no longer talking about measuring something tangible and concrete, but are now venturing into a world where we need to extract information from inside an individual's mind and draw inferences about it. I was talking to a finance specialist the other day at my company, and he was having a hard time understanding why it takes so many people, so much time, and so much money to develop test questions. While inside my mind I was thinking, have you tried it? <laughs> my response was, it's not about the test question. It's about making sure that the test question elicits a response that reflects what we're trying to measure. There's an extensive process involved in building educational tests. The first thing that you have to do is define what it is that you want to measure. For example, adding single-digit numbers. You then need to develop a number of test questions that you believe are going to elicit responses reflective of what you're trying to measure. You then have to test the questions by having some students answer them. You use the student responses to determine if the questions are working or if they need to be revised. Each time you revise a question, you have to test it again. Eventually, once, you're once you've concluded that all of your questions are working appropriately, you can use them on a test. So let's assume that you manage to pull together a number of test questions that make it through your quality checks. How many questions do you need? What kinds of questions do you need? Turns out the answer depends primarily on what you want to be able to say about the test takers. Consider a question that asks a student to complete the equation 2 plus 2 equals. The student gets the question correct. What do you know about the student? Can the student add? We don't know. Can the student add single-digit numbers? We don't know. Can the student add to four? We don't know. It turns out that answering the single question correctly tells you very little about what the student knows. At best, you can validly conclude that the student can probably add 2 plus 2. If we want our tests to generate scores that tell us something about what a student knows, then it's, we need to go beyond simply having high quality items. This brings me to the second pillar that underlies assessment, design. I would argue that the most critical piece of building an assessment centers in the design or the story that you want to tell about the test takers. Building on the example earlier, if you want to know whether or not a student can add single digit numbers, then you need to ask them multiple questions in multiple ways that require them to add multiple single-digit numbers. The design of the test, the constructs you are measuring, how you elicit student responses, and the evidence you gather all determine the story you are able to tell. But you can't stop there. Think about taking someone's temperature. You can use a thermometer to determine whether or not someone has a fever. But the fact that they have a fever doesn't tell you what's wrong with them or what to do about it. The measurement in isolation is insufficient. You have to use the indicator, in this case the thermometer, 
coupled with additional information about the patient to determine what your next steps are. The third pillar of good assessment stems from how you use the results to tell the story. I've been privileged in my career to work with a number of highly qualified and impressive individuals. Recently, I had the opportunity to present some state test results to a key group of representatives from a State Department of Education. The information that they found most compelling was not how the students performed on the test statewide. It was not how the students performed students' performance in that state compared to student performance in another state. And it was not how student performance in that state in that year compared to prior years. The evidence they found most compelling was an example of a single teacher's struggle to educate a single student. This single example led the officials to determine that the educational standards were too demanding and needed to be implemented gradually. The officials were compelled by the anecdote, not by the data gathered across multiple individuals. What if the anecdote is the exception, not the rule? What if listening to the data would have led the officials to another conclusion? Had the officials listened to the data, they would have realized that students had not only performed poorly in the state that year, but they, performing, they had been performing poorly on similar content for a number of years. The poor performance was not situational. It was a documented trend. The data also revealed that students were performing poorly in relation to another state. The data were telling the story that the students were not learning the material. Imagine if instead of slowing the implementation of the new standards, the officials had called for new instructional strategies. The officials missed an opportunity to promote learning and instead lowered student expectations. Even as I was preparing for this talk, I was told to make my talk more compelling by adding specific examples to illustrate my points. <coughs> Anecdotes can be effective. We just need to make sure that they reflect stories that are supported by data. Let's make sure we are listening to the data and telling the right story. At its core, psychometrics is all about interpreting and translating information. We use tests to quantify what people know, and then we translate that information into stories. The next time someone you know takes a test, ask to see the report. Take the time to explore the data presented in the report. Listen to the story. Think about the three pillars of testing. If the story the report tells is not clear, take the time to elicit the story the data are trying to reveal. Ask questions. You can use the stories to give students a voice. Use the information to foster further discussions with the test taker, with a parent, with a teacher, with an educator, or even with someone like me, a psychometrician. Do more than tell the story. Help support good decision-making. Motivate change. Today, you have learned about educational testing and the science psychometrics that underlies it. Please, don't stop there, but take the next steps. I encourage you to embrace data become informed, and motivate change. Thank you.